The Gilcrease Museum collection contains literally hundreds of thousands of artworks, documents, and artifacts. Today we're here for a special exhibit of textiles. They're out of the vault and out on display. I'm Barbara Cohenauer. Welcome to Focus on Art. My guest for Weaving Through Time is Dan McPike. Dan is the senior curator. Hi, Dan. Welcome to Focus on Art. Barbara, nice of you to come. We appreciate your being with we'll us. We have all the people from Rogers County down here. Absolutely. We're going to try and do that. Okay, now we have textiles in this exhibit that represent roughly 9,000 years of textile development in North America. Yes, the textiles that we have in the collection or not, don't, don't go back quite 9,000 years. But uh, as a matter of fact, we really don't know how old some of these are. They're, they're only that they're pre-ceramic and they're from caves in uh, dry caves in the Ozarks in northwestern Arkansas and southwestern Missouri. But uh, they're identical except for the materials they're made from. In the West, they used uh, uh, pocanum, which is a, a form of hemp, and yucca. And in the Ozarks, they tended to use grasses and cedar and cedar okay. bast and that sort of thing. But other than that, the uh, the uh, the form, and uh, I should mention here that uh, textile. We're using textiles in the the broad sense, in that anything woven is is a textile. Uh, but the the forms of the sandals, the oldest dated sandal uh, from North America. Uh, the oldest dated artifact, as a matter of fact, bioradiocarbon is uh, bioradiocarbon is a sandal found in uh, Oregon uh, that dates about uh, 9,000 years ago. But the materials that we have here from the Ozarks are virtually identical in all respects to those old sandals and other items found in, in, the, in the West. So if we see your show, we're looking at things that may be a little bit newer, but they have the same look as things created that far back. Well, fact, this the similarities are amazing sometimes. <laughs> all right. Well, this is a very interesting piece that you have at the beginning here. Dan, tell us a little bit about this. Well, it appears to be a uh, shaman's hood. I would imagine it it's for, was for use in imitative magic. And since it has horns of this ilk, I would assume that it may have had something to do with, with bison, maybe imitative magic to uh, a dance to bring bison or to make a, uh, a uh, hunt to the west into the bison country more successful. And uh, probably as you can see where the, the fellow's head fit in here. Absolutely. And also the straps that uh, uh, tied the thing on. And uh, it's really amazing that something like this, it looks like it's uh, almost fresh. Well, I mean, the grass is dried, mm -hmm. but it, uh, it certainly doesn't look like it's, and it's pre-ceramic, so it's bound to be at least 1,500 years, and how much older than that, I don't know. Wow. But uh, it is rather uh, amazing piece, and I don't know anybody else that has one like it, as a matter of fact. Well, just typical of the Gilcrease collection. Excellent in every area. And we have here, the, uh, the, the subtitle of this uh, show is uh, uh, Sandals to Saddle Blankets. And once again, we have items from Northwest Arkansas and Southwest Missouri Dry Caves. And if you look at these items and then go find a, a book that has uh, sandals uh, from places like Fort Rock Cave in Oregon or from uh, there are a number of other uh, caves clear down in New Mexico that have uh, sandals, except for the materials, like this is cedar here and, and, and grass up here, grass here. Um, the items are virtually identical to those that, uh, from that period. The reason I have this one sort of a mat here is it shows how there's also a, a cloth 
that precedes, this is almost the beginning of a true, what some people would consider a true ceramic, or a, a true uh, textile, uh, in that it is uh, the, the assembly of it, where it's a twisted cloth and then uh, uh, arranged by this, or uh, organized in this method, is a cloth they had in the Southwest uh, very early, which was called fur cloth, and uh, they would take, they didn't have large animals, or they didn't hunt large animals like they did on the plains, mm -hmm. uh, so they wouldn't have a, an animal large enough to make an entire uh, piece of clothing. So they'd uh, take the, say, rabbits or small animals and uh, strip their uh, fur with, the, or strip the hide with the fur on and then uh, twine it together to make a cloth. And they also did that with feathers. Um, and it was called feather cloth, but it was probably used more for esoteric purposes, whereas this was used for warmth. But this, this is an example of, of uh, vegetal material that uh, was made in the same, uh, by the same method as they used in the Southwest to make the fur cloth. And of course these other items are also woven of grass and other sandals and baskets and so forth. Okay, and then the obvious step from something like this is to a fabric, as we would know a fabric to be today. Yeah, this is uh, what anybody would consider to be a, a textile. And the Anasazi, the ancestors of the modern Pueblo Indians, about uh, A.D. 1000 or so, obtained from Mexico uh, their first uh, cotton. Maybe even at first they obtained cotton cloth, but they certainly obtained uh, uh, cotton fibers, which they uh, uh, spun or what was spun into uh, yarn. And uh, these are late examples, but they are very similar. To uh, the, with the early examples, where, for instance, had the, the uh, designs in in wool, but they didn't have any wool. Uh, but they just made plain cotton uh, cloth, and since it was plain, uh, we'll look at that a little bit later. They they decided to design it, and they did it in a rather unusual fashion. But uh, these are examples of. Uh, early Anasazi uh, uh, blankets would have uh, looked like blankets probably slept on also wore. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now to do this they had to have a loom. Yeah, so we have a, uh, now this is a later loom. Now Dan, this is the same kind of loom that the Anastasi would have used, right? This is a true loom. The, uh, the things that we looked at before, like the fur and feather cloth, would have been done on a uh, loom that wasn't a true loom, one that was suspended merely from the top. This one is anchored at the bottom. And beginning about AD uh, 1000, you find anchor holes of looms in the kivas of the, of the Anasazi. And the, the weaving was done, the early weaving of the Anasazi. In fact, still, the weaving of the Anasazi is done by, by men rather than women. And uh, they, the, the Navajo then picked this loom up from the uh, Pueblo Indians, mm -hmm. uh, as I say, maybe before, but certainly by uh, 1680, soon after the Pueblo Revolt, the Navajo were living in the Chama River area in northern New Mexico. And uh, uh, they, by this time, they also would have had sheep. Now, the, the Navajo seldom or may very early have, have woven with cotton as did the Anasazi, but they were, by the time the Navajo started weaving with this true loom like this, and this has a little uh, two gray hills uh, Navajo uh, rug on the, uh, the bottom, miniature on the bottom of it, um, and the other equipment, the uh, battens and the combs and so forth uh, that were used. Uh, this is essentially what the, the Navajo got from the Anasazi, and the wool is what they got from the Spanish, uh, at least by AD, uh, or by uh, uh, 1680, the time of the, the uh, Pueblo Revolt. Okay, what's next? Okay, let's go over here and look at some uh, designs. They, uh, they had a little trouble with their designs to begin with. What kind of 
trouble did they have, Dan? Well, people like to have things uh, painted or decorated in some fashion, and uh, their, their trouble was that they had nothing but white cotton, I guess, for a little while. Just okay. like they had nothing but plain white pottery for a little while, and they didn't like it. So they designed their pottery, and uh, since they didn't have any way to dye the cloth that they made, the cotton cloth that they made, they uh, painted their cloth and they use the same designs they use on the pottery. And you can see we've got blown up photographs of some of the cloth that was made uh, oh, several hundred years back, maybe even a thousand years ago. And uh, you can see how they took the designs that they used off the uh, pottery. Oh, and, that's uh, an interesting comparison. And some of the other material in here is a little bit later, but this, uh, this is an example of the prehistoric Anasazi uh, designs and, and where they derived them from. They, they would have used uh, mineral paint. Uh, some of the pottery they used carbon paint, but that wouldn't use. It had to be fired to turn black. So uh, I see. They, okay, well over here in this painting, then we have some of these similar designs. Were these designs, on, say, on this well, latest dress taken from the pottery? Yeah. And you could get uh, well, alt it grew out of the pottery. Yeah. But by this time, of course, this, this is the early 20th century, late 19th century, and uh, they had also uh, d uh, learned to embroider from the Spaniards. And uh, they generally, the black on the uh, uh, cloth is, is wool and the white is cotton. So this goes back and this was introduced by the Spanish and the designs, once again, uh, are, came from the uh, idea of the pottery. And uh, we also have uh, the um, claw, the actual dress that this woman's name is Crusita. She was a model of uh, Joseph Henry Sharp. And we have over here uh, the dress that uh, she's wearing in this painting. And uh, you can, and you can see, see the, the embroidery on top uh, of that. You can see the on both sides. You can see that this was introduced by later by the Spaniards. The early designs, uh, you've seen some already, uh, but the, for ordinary cloth, the uh, color was, uh, we'll see here in a minute, but this is also some of uh, Crusita's, uh, uh, the sash or belt, woman's belt that she's wearing, and the uh, boots that she's wearing in the painting, and the uh, pot that is in the hearth over here uh, on the, uh, Now, if we go along here and pass the dress, we might want to just go in down this way. This is an embroidery design, but this is woven in. Yes, and this is typical uh, of the uh, Anasazi blankets that are striped blankets, and this is a design that was first picked up by the Navajo. Uh, we'll look at some non-Navajo Idaho, Idaho uh, non Navajo items here in a minute, but uh, I want to mention here that this, uh, the very early Navajo weaving, although it was done with wool rather than with cotton as the, as the Anasazi did it, or the modern, or the Pueblo uh, descendants of the Anasazi did it, the uh, Navajo, when they began to weave, uh, adopted these early uh, uh, Pueblo designs of, this, of the simple stripes. And we also have some uh, weaving from the northwest coast area. This is a Salish blanket that's woven of uh, Rocky Mountain goat hair and dog wool. And uh, this was done, uh, we don't know for sure what, what looms they used to do these on or how they wove them. Uh, they may be simply uh, finger woven or they probably used a, a, a hanging loom of some sort because it does have a herringbone twill type pattern. And uh, this was passed on then. The, the, this is done by the Salish Indians and uh, they passed on their traditions to, among others, some of the Penutian speakers, the Napersa and the Asperse Indians of uh, Idaho to the east of them, and also some of the other uh, Salishian speaking, or the uh, other Penutian speaking Indians of the area. Uh, this habit, uh, or uh, 
custom of making what are called sally bags. Actually, they have to be fairly late because they're woven of uh, corn husk and wool. And But the designs, once again, you can see is the Anasazi took their designs from their pottery. The uh, designs of these sally bags were quite obviously taken from the uh, basketry of the northwest coast. This is a plingit or basket, which is uh, far to the north, but they made similar designs down into uh, even as far in, uh, south as, as uh, northern California. And another item of the northwest coast is this uh, Chilkat blanket. This is the northern end of the northwest coast, uh, southern Alaska. Many of the Chilkat were uh, also Tlingit Indians that were responsible for this basket over here. And uh, they made these things uh, by the thousands, and they were giveaways and sometimes destroyed in the elaborate parties they had, which were called potlatches. Wow, and, okay. Uh, and they, to the north of them, the Eskimo made, and you'll find Anasazi stockings from the southwest that are virtually identical to these stockings that were woven of grass by the Eskimo to put inside their mucklups, keep their feet warm and dry. And the Eskimo also wove uh, baskets, or uh, uh, little baskets, of uh, baleen, of uh, whale bone. This is a strainer out of a whale's mouth, and it could be stripped. And you can see the piece of uh, baleen here as it came out of the whale's mouth. Now, Dan, if we leave these things that were created uh, in the early Ozarks and uh, the early Anastasi, we'll come over to this area, which deals primarily with the Navajo. Okay, we come up to, this is sort of the big bit, the, the Navajo are already weaving, but uh, we're, we're up to 1807 now, and there are two brothers, the, the uh, weavers in the Rio Grande were, were not doing so well as the Navajo were, and the Spanish didn't like this, so they brought two brothers up from Saltillo to teach the Rio Grande weavers how to improve their wares and overtake the Navajo, so to speak. And this is an example of a Saltillo uh, serape that was made in, the, uh, in Mexico, in Saltillo. And uh, the, the brothers were gonna show the Rio Grande people how to do this. And uh, the Rio Grande people never really caught on to the, got the quality of the uh, Saltillo Serape. But the Navajo, on the other hand, continued to be the prime reavers of the Southwest, and they picked up the, uh, a lot of the elements from the uh, Saltillo blankets. And uh, the, the, the uh, terrace uh, step designs and the triangles and so forth. And uh, they uh, then went on to uh, improve on both the Rio Grande and the Saltillo and what they got from the Anasazi uh, to become uh, by far the prime weavers of not only the Southwest, but as far as I'm concerned, the, the entire entirety of North America and uh, still are. <laughs> All right. Now, in these next two galleries, we're just going to kind of walk through. These galleries are just designed so that the viewers can kind of stop in the middle of the exhibit and really appreciate things just for their aesthetic value. Yeah, you know, the original idea was uh, the show was to represent or to, to show the Navajo weaving as as art, and here we have the uh, af after the uh, uh, Saltillo period and, and up until. Uh, the year 1863, the uh, uh, Navajo had a, what, what's called the classic period. Then 1863, they were taken as prisoners to a place called Bosque Redondo in eastern New Mexico. Okay. And this begins the transitional period. They're uh, uh, changed and uh, the, the government furnished them some wool to uh, replace those uh, sheep that they had had and the dyes became different. They had used indigo and a ravel cloth called uh, bayetta, and now they have uh, largely uh, uh, commercial dyes and some commercial yarn, Germantown, and uh, um, Saxony wool that they dyed in the Germantown, already dyed yarn, and they used that for reds. They continued to 
uh, make blankets up until uh, oh, around uh, there's, uh, 1880, 1890, the tourists began to want their wares to use as, as rugs rather than blankets. And of course, there's no difference between an early rug and a, and a blanket. I mean, they just use blankets. Just depends for on what rugs, you call yeah, it. Depends on what you call All right. it. At any rate, by uh, 18. 90 and the, the, this is uh, where the rug period starts uh, in this gallery. In this gallery we have a, a continuation of the rug. Actually the rug period uh, might have started a little bit earlier and then this, uh, this gallery is referred to as the modern and regional. Uh, some people consider the regional not to start until about uh, 1920 or so but actually it started and uh, with uh, Lorenzo Hubble and, uh, and a fellow named Moore who was a crystal, or, uh, Hubble was at uh, Ganado Trading Post, and they, they uh, suggested some styles and colors and designs and so forth uh, that really began the rug period and also the regional period. You get uh, some, uh, quite a bit of, uh, oh, disagreement is what constitutes a region anyway. Some people say there are only about five, some people say there are 20 or 30. But All right. uh, at any rate, one, one thing you can uh, mention, and most people when they think of Navajo rugs think of regional rugs. Is this rug a Ganado? Is this rug a uh, Western region? Is this rug a Tish Nose Post? Is this? And uh, a tremendous number of the rugs can't be categorized until more uh, recent uh, time now. In the gift shop now we have rugs that have the name of the the, uh, the, the weaver and the uh, trading post that the rug came from. Uh, but prior to that, if you have a definite rug that you can say is, is just definitely uh, crystal or definitely two, two gray hills is the easiest one to pick. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the sort of the Cadillac of the rugs and they uh, they has no, uh, no dyes. It's all natural wool. The black might be enhanced slightly, but it's only uh, gray, black, and uh, white, and brown, the natural sheep colors. Like this, this one, one for this example? This one is sort of like, a, this isn't a two gray hill, but it's similar to a two gray hill. It's got uh, a little bit of color in it. And then also uh, two of the regions that are recognizable are those regions which are responsible for the manufacture of what are called yay rugs. This one would probably be from the Lukachuki Mountain area because it has a black background. They also make Yevichai rugs in the Shiprock area, generally having a lighter uh, colored background. And uh, then this is a border rug, very similar to that that uh, Moore would have uh, uh, designed. He was at Crystal Trading Post, and then uh, he left Crystal Trading Post, and Crystal change to, uh, this isn't necessarily a crystal, but they changed after he left to more a, a straight uh, um, vegetal dyed uh, stripe design or linear design. And uh, the more, the old crystal design went to Two Gray Hills by some hooker crook and became the Two Gray Hills rug. Then this one is a uh, sand painting rug which uh, is uh, this particular sand painting was uh, called the uh, Whirling Log and it was part of a, a healing ceremony. The, uh, the handshaker would, uh, uh, the, uh, the shaman would decide what was wrong with somebody and uh, they would have this ceremony. Some of them lasted up to nine days and so the uh, shaman or shamans would make the sand painting on the floor and the individual would sit on it as part of the healing ceremony. Now Dan, this looks like the Mexican weaving that we saw in the uh, earlier gallery. Well it is. This is another Saltillo Serape and uh, once again it's put here to represent the, the style of uh, Serape weaving that was uh, uh, and the quality of Serape weaving that was brought up uh, by the uh, Bazan brothers in 1807 to improve the Rio Grande. And as I mentioned in the other gallery, the Navajo were really the people that took this over and, and made do with it. But they continued to, uh, the, the, the Spanish and some Indians uh, that to serve them as uh, weavers or slaves or what have you, uh, continued to weave in the Rio Grande and ultimately this would become uh, what uh, most tourists of the early part of this century and into the second half of the century came to know as the Chamayo weaving as after uh, 
uh, Chamago village in, in northern New Mexico. And uh, this is, uh, once again, as we had in the other gallery, this represents an early attempt at uh, achieving the, the uh, okay. uh, Serape design. And these other, uh, uh, these were used always wall hangers primarily by people or still are. Uh, you find a lot of restaurants and a lot of homes that have their furniture maybe covered with these or you use as wall hangers and they're very fine uh, uh, weaving that they, they are uh, done by uh, descendants of the Hispanic settlers of uh, New Mexico rather than by the Navajo and I'm sure that a lot of people will recognize particularly this last one as uh, something that they have seen thousands of Yes. Uh, spread all over the country. And I bet we all wish that we'd bought these back in the 40s when, yeah, they, were when they were rather <laughs> inexpensive yeah. instead of today. And in fact, they don't make all that many of them anymore. Yeah. Okay, now here were the, here, these are saddle blankets. And this is part of kind of the subtitle of this exhibit. Yeah, so sandals to saddle blankets. All and, right. uh, so this is, uh, uh, these are saddle blankets. I've uh, demarked here that there's one unused and one well used. This one is well used. It belonged to the uh, artist Olaf Vighorst. We have his uh, studio over in the uh, next uh, row of galleries there. And you and still have the horse hair his, there. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> this horse hair is well ground into it. And of course, it's been wet because it's faded. And uh, then we also uh, show this uh, Navajo, very proud. Navajo decked out in all of his uh, finery, uh, with his rifle and his boots and uh, the leggings and so forth, and his horse and his saddle. And uh, we have over here the uh, same, uh, these, in, in the case of Crusita, we had the actual clothing that the individual was wearing. In the case of uh, Vincente, uh, we don't have the actual clothing but we do have uh, a number of saddle blankets and uh, blankets or serapes that were similar to those that he's wearing, as well as all of his jewelry. And this is intended uh, primarily as, uh, uh, this is the unused saddle blanket. It's very common, very typical of the uh, uh, diamond shaped double saddle blankets that were, uh, and these, although people don't think about saddle blankets when they think about the Navajo. They think about uh, blankets in the old days and rugs. Uh, all through they made saddle blankets and they're very, very uh, common. And a beautiful and design have, just to put under the saddle on a yeah, horse. Yeah, you notice the similarity between the design here and the design uh, on the uh, this other saddle blanket we have under the saddle. And uh, this is, this, we wind up here with strictly a, a decorative case with uh, uh, sort of a, an exuberation of the Navajo rugs and uh, the Navajo in general. They're well, very fond of horses. Great. Well, Dan, it's been a wonderful morning here at Gilcrease. I appreciate your sharing all your knowledge with us. It's a great show. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for coming, Barbara. And we'll you have to come back and bring bring all the students and bring all the, all everybody from that part of the country down here so they can see all this. And all right. For those of you at home, we appreciate your being with us. As always, we'll look forward to having you back again for Focus on Art.